He had the power and wealth of a king. He was a billionaire times over. He killed anyone who stood in his way of becoming the world's most powerful drug lord. Power was untouchable. He terrorized the nation of Colombia and made an enemy of the most powerful nation on earth. Drug money. He was the crown jewel. He is what we wanted. Pablo Escobar and his cocaine cartel became bigger than his own government. He was the Da Vinci of crime, the bandit of bandits. His empire was vast. He was invincible. He had it all. He had the wealth, the fame. Pablo Escobar became so big that Pablo needed to die. December 2nd, 1993. A team of heavily armed police officers converge on a two-story row house in the Los Olivos neighborhood of Medellin, Colombia. This moment is the culmination of the largest manhunt in history. The United States has devoted all of its intelligence and military assets to finding Pablo Escobar. Hundreds of millions of dollars in its most elite troops and some of its most secret units. After all this time, all this money and effort and bloodshed, they finally found him. I never really knew that much about Pablo Escobar until I was working on my book, Black Hawk Down. And one day I was interviewing a fellow who was connected with Special Forces, and he had a picture on the wall of his office of a bloody, dead fat man on a rooftop surrounded by all these grinning men with rifles. And I interrupted him and said, excuse me, you have to tell me what that is. And he said, that, my friend, is Pablo Escobar. I keep that picture on my wall to remind me that no matter how rich you get in this life, you can still be too big for your britches. And what that suggested to me was that the United States military had been much more involved in hunting down Pablo Escobar and killing him than I had previously thought. Mark Bowden's bestseller, Killing Pablo, uncovered a vicious covert war underwritten by the U.S. government in one of the most violent countries on Earth. Incinerated by nearly 40 years of bloody civil war, Colombians have long been brutalized by both Marxist guerrillas and the right-wing paramilitary death squads who oppose them. A subhuman conflict fueled by a multi-billion dollar trade in cocaine. Colombia's ascension to its place as the kidnapping and terror capital of the world began in a 1950s era of political turmoil. Colombians refer to that period simply as la violencia, uh, which means just the violence. And there were hundreds of thousands of people killed, and for no real reason. There was no coherent structure to the conflict. It was just Colombia. Sparked by the revolutionary rhetoric of Che Guevara and Fidel Castro, bandits roamed the jungles and perfected the Colombian art of terror. The Colombians themselves have a joke that they tell about how God made their country so beautiful. It's tall Andes mountains, it's tropical jungles, it's beaches, it's fertile soil, that he evened the score by populating their country with the most evil race of men. of La Violencia emerged one of the most violent criminals the world would ever see. Pablo Escobar was born in 1949, right in the middle of this period of La Violencia, so his childhood was set in the context of this bloodletting. Escobar's criminal career starts modestly in the 1960s in his hometown Medellin as a small-time racketeer and marijuana dealer. Pablo was a dope smoker from a fairly early age. Colombia was known here in the United States for being a source of some of the strongest, uh, most potent marijuana in the world. America's counterculture establishes a robust market for Colombian marijuana. But it's the arrival of cocaine in the early 70s, which presents a criminal opportunity that would shape the future of Colombia. By 
the mid-1970s, cocaine began to become a more fashionable drug of choice. And this was perfect for a smuggler in Colombia because it's a difference between uh, why carry an elephant when you could put a mouse in your pocket. We have a very big jungle, and the countryside has a very little uh, presence by the government and by the state. Most of the area outside the cities is really wild territory. So a certain amount of law and order exists within the cities. But outside the cities, in the mountains and in the jungle, there's very little law and order. And it's in that uh, lack of authority and in the, that lack of presence of the state where uh, most of the problems brew, where most of the coca has been growing, where most of the uh, violent conflicts and the violence originates. Well, Pablo Escobar was not a brilliant entrepreneur or organizer. What he was is uh, more violent uh, and ruthless than most of the people who were engaged in this business. And in that way, he was able to consolidate most of the uh, lucrative drug trafficking routes out of Colombia. In 1975, Escobar offers to sell 14 kilos of cocaine to Medellin drug boss Fabio Restrepo. Pablo set up his first deal with Fabio Restrepo. They saw him as a sort of a common street criminal, and they definitely underestimated him. Three weeks later, Restrepo was found dead. And they were informed uh, sort of unceremoniously that they now worked for Pablo Escobar. Pablo introduced a level of violence into the business that they were not used to, and so they were really in over their heads. Escobar expands his business by putting police and judges in his pocket. What Pablo learned about law enforcement from a young age in Medellin was that it could be bought. Those who were determined enough to come after him or honest enough to continue to pursue him and arrest him would be killed. Fueled by America's appetite for the white powder, Escobar's power grows exponentially. He became the king of cocaine, the uh, titular head of the Medellin cartel. And the Medellin cartel had the reputation, well-deserved in my opinion, of being one of the most uh, ruthless, violent, murderous criminal organizations in the world. The Colombian cartels were the one that introduced the drug to the U.S. and sold uh, them in U.S. streets. So they, they had a huge uh, business. Well, Pablo began making uh, more money than certainly anyone in Colombia had ever seen before. He spent his money lavishly on anything that, uh, that struck his fancy. He built an extravagant estate for himself in the middle Magdalena Valley, uh, which he called Napolis. He had a zoo. At his, at his ranch, you're talking about Colombia, a guy had elephants, zebras, rhinoceroses. He imported uh, exotic animals, had planes, helicopters. He was invincible. He, he had it all. He had the wealth, the fame. It is a lifestyle Pablo fiercely protects. Colombia was a place where, certainly in the underworld, if you wanted to survive, you had to be uh, more feared than your rivals. And so Pablo cultivated his reputation for violence. One of the stories that I was told is that at a party, at a dinner party at his house, his people caught someone stealing silverware from his kitchen. He had the waiter who stole the silverware bound hand and foot and then kicked him into the swimming pool and had his guests all watch this man drown and announced that this is what happened to anyone who stole from Pablo Escobar. He was a terrible criminal. He used terrorism in a way that Colombia never before uh, had seen. As the Medellin cartel grows in power, Marxist guerrilla movements such as FARC also grow in strength. Even though in his early days, Pablo liked to use Marxist rhetoric, he rapidly became uh, the richest man in Colombia. And as such, he became a target for some of the leftist guerrilla movements in the hills. So Pablo joined with a lot of other wealthy drug traffickers to form their own private armies, uh, paramilitaries, to go after the uh, guerrilla units. Two of the early paramilitary leaders who Pablo worked with were Fidel and Carlos Castaño. My father was kidnapped in the year of 79 by the FARC guerrillas. 
Eh, Andar a 180 degrees. 380 grados, éramos campesinos. With the Colombian government unable to protect its citizens from Marxist guerrillas, Carlos Castaño and brother Fidel established a paramilitary army called the AUC. Once they cowardly killed my father, I made a decision to fight. They created this organization of paramilitaries with the support of the drug traffickers, primarily the Medellin cartel. This is when my brother Fidel met Escobar and began a friendship with Escobar. The Castaños became uh, allies of the Escobar organization. The paramilitaries were an armed branch of the drug traffickers. Of course, uh, with all the kind of private army he had and a huge amount of money, he became very powerful. Pablo had ambitions to be more than just the wealthiest man in Colombia and its most successful criminal. He wanted to be beloved by the people of Colombia and he wanted to have a legitimate political power. And so he began spending some of his millions on projects for the poor people in Medellin. He uh, funded the building of housing and recreational centers and soccer pitches and embarking on a lot of sort of private welfare programs that uh, something that the government of Colombia would never have done. The objective of Pablo's political campaign, avoiding extradition to the United States. That was the one thing that they feared more than anything because whereas in Colombia they could manipulate the justice system by killing judges, by corrupting them, by, by all sorts of coercion, uh, once they got to this country, they were just another defendant and they were willing to die rather than go to the United States. In 1982, he was elected to the Congress as an alternate, but the first time he tried to take his seat in the House, he was denounced uh, by the Minister of Justice, Rodrigo Lara, as a notorious drug trafficker and criminal. Escobar's criminal history surfaces in the Colombian press, and his fall from grace is swift. Pablo is banished from the political scene, and many of his assets are seized. Pablo is deeply humiliated by uh, Lara's denunciation, and really from that day forward uh, was at war with the state of Colombia. The U.S. ambassador had warned Lara that his life was in danger, in fact, had given him a bulletproof vest. Three months after taking his stand against Escobar, Lara is tracked by one of Pablo's gunmen. Justice Minister Rodrigo Lara is the first Colombian to take a stand against drug lord Pablo Escobar. April 30th, 1984, Lara is followed from his office by one of Escobar's hired guns. vest provided by the U.S. government is found by his side. With the amount of bullets in his body, it's clear that the vest wouldn't have saved his life anyway. While Lara's killing puts Pablo at war with Colombia, he has yet to become a target for the Americans. Well, initially, Pablo Escobar and the other drug traffickers were uh, cons considered to be sort of romantic, dashing figures. In programs like Miami Vice here in the United States, they were portrayed as somewhat romantic figures. Assuming the risks of drug use was considered to be part of what made it cool. And so it was really uh, the, the hip world against the square world. Uh, the square world was sort of epitomized by the Reagan administration program, which was Nancy Reagan's Just Say No program. Little kids doing drugs, it turns my stomach. Don't mess with them. Just say no. In the early 80s, cocaine begins to transform the landscape of urban America. 
Public attitudes began to change when cocaine began arriving in the United States in a new form. Instead of being a powder that you sift, it was then now being sold as crack, and it was very inexpensive. And that quickly became hugely popular with the poorer classes in the United States and was just a devastating plague in our cities. The change from just normal cocaine to, to crack had a huge uh, impact on, on U.S. policies. It had not only afflicted the people who became addicted to crack, but then these people would set out to steal in order to sustain their addiction. So the cities became plagued by an epidemic of violence and crime. A very high percentage of the murders that take place in the United States are somehow or other connected with uh, cocaine trafficking. And suddenly, people like Pablo Escobar were not seen by everyone as such romantic, dashing figures and became much more perceived as violent criminals. We're striving for a world where April 1982 can live happier. In answer to the growing crime rate in America, Reagan signs National Security Directive 221, declaring drug trafficking a threat to national security. Pablo became something much more than a law enforcement problem. He became a real a military target, a real threat to world civilization. As policy shifts in America, Escobar escalates his war against the government of Colombia. At the heart of Pablo's war against the government of Colombia was his fear of extradition. In Colombia, Pablo knew he could bribe or intimidate judges or juries or even prison executives. Uh, in the United States, he knew that, that he couldn't. He had a lot of judges who were against him killed. That was his fight, trying to show Colombia that he was tougher than Colombia. Pablo's policy in his war against the government was called plomo o plato, which means silver or lead. You can accept Pablo's bribe or you can accept his bullets. It was very easy to accept Pablo's bribes. They were generous uh, and reliable. And also the alternative to accepting the bribe was that you, you and your family would be killed. So it became very difficult not to do what Pablo wanted you to do. Escobar was very invincible. In other words, nobody thought, you know, they could ever take him down. So people were afraid to talk. They were afraid to go up against him because they know they would end up dead. Pablo was untouchable. You know, he had contacts all over the government, and uh, he had access to, to virtually anybody in Colombia. Under those circumstances, it took an extraordinary amount of integrity and courage uh, to go after Pablo Escobar. Among the few who publicly oppose Escobar is General Miguel Maza. General Maza, who was the head of the DAS, which is the equivalent of the FBI in the United States, was probably the one person that was seriously going after Pablo. And Pablo twice tried to assassinate Maza with huge bombs. May 30th, 1989. Escobar targets Maza with a remote detonated car bomb. Maza's car was at the center of the blast. Its wheels were melted to the road, but he managed to kick the door open and step out unhurt. It killed many people. Fortunately, I was spared from death in that attempt. Pablo was trying to kill Maza, and Maza was trying to get Pablo Escobar. In his obsession to kill Maza, Escobar does not care who gets in the way. 500 kilogram bomb was placed in a bus which was driven in front of the headquarters building of the DAS, which was occupied by Massa, and was detonated. Hundreds of people were injured at that time, and about 70 uh, people were actually killed. The carriage of the bus ended up on top of the 11th floor of the building. It is only by the grace of God that General Miguel Massa is here to tell you this story. Escobar wages war on the Colombian judicial system. Pablo paid a guerrilla group called M-19 to invade the Palace of Justice and kidnap basically the entire Supreme Court in Colombia. The M-19 went into the courthouse for the purpose of taking and destroying all the evidence against the drug traffickers. Most of the Supreme Court judges were killed. Um, records were destroyed. 
The government responded to the invasion of the Palace of Justice by invading it, which led to a bloodbath during which 11 of the country's 21 Supreme Court justices were killed. There was no institution that was safe from Pablo Escobar. The issue of extradition became a centerpiece of the 1989 presidential campaign. Louis Galan was the leading candidate for president. Galan was campaigning, promising to utilize extradition to rid Colombia of drug traffickers like Pablo Escobar. Escobar and his gang decided that uh, Galan was an obstacle, that he shouldn't be president of, of Colombia. August 18th, 1989. Galan prepares to deliver a campaign speech in Sochoa, southwest of Bogota. Pablo Escobar targeted him and had him killed. Pablo was responsible for assassinating three of the five candidates for president. The man who took Galan's place was his campaign manager, a man named Cesar Gaviria. This was a very, very difficult period. Escobar was trying to kill me. If he had the possibility of killing me, he would not doubt a second. November 27, 1989. Presidential candidate Gaviria is scheduled to fly Avianca Airlines Flight 1803 from Bogota to Cali. One of Pablo Escobar's lieutenants is instructed to board the plane with a suitcase he is told contains a listening device. Unbeknownst to Escobar's man, the suitcase is in fact a bomb. November 27, 1989. In an attempt to assassinate Colombian presidential candidate Cesar Gaviria, cocaine boss Pablo Escobar tricks one of his own lieutenants into carrying what he believes is a listening device aboard the candidate's plane from Bogota to Cali. Avianca Flight 1803 goes down in the mountains outside Bogota. 110 people are killed. There are no survivors. Gaviria, as it happens, was not on the plane. But at the point where Pablo bombed an airplane, he became what the United States considers a clear and present danger. There were two American citizens killed on that plane. So under the long arm statutes, we could prosecute him for the Avianca plane. With cocaine continuing to flow across the borders, American drug policy changes from intercepting drug shipments to taking down cartel leaders. It became very evident that we had to target them uh, more specifically. As their power grew, it became evident that they had to be dealt with. When George Bush was elected president in 1988, he changed our country's policy against drugs to targeting the drug kingpins, like men like Pablo Escobar. And for the drug kingpins, the death penalty. November 2nd, 1989. President Bush's legal counsel drafts a reinterpretation of the long-standing executive order prohibiting the assassination of foreign nationals. The new interpretation of the prohibition said that if the president of the United States determined that someone was a threat to national security or to the lives of American citizens, that that person could become a target for assassination. Our forces could go out and not just try to find them and arrest them, but actually kill them. America's premier counterterrorism team prepares for a potential mission. Delta Force is the Army's top secret counterterrorism unit that specializes in finding people and going after them and is considered to be one of the best in the world at doing this. Our existence is still not recognized by the Department of, of Defense. Regardless of whether or not we exist, the unit has some highly motivated, select individuals that specialize in these kinds of operations. As Delta Force stands by, a new group of covert soldiers has already entered Colombia. The CIA had obviously always had a presence in Colombia, but after the Avianca airliner bombing, the Colombian government invited the United States to help them go after Pablo Escobar. The U.S. dispatches a secret surveillance unit, codenamed Centrospike. Centrospike has certain technologies that's highly sensitive. 
I'm not going to go into what they have or don't have. Centra Spike is another top secret army unit that consists mostly of language experts and technicians who specialize in finding people by eavesdropping on their electronic communications and using radio telemetry to target their location. Flying under the cover of an aviation technician team, Centra Spike begins eavesdropping and triangulating phone conversations. One of the things that Centra Spike did was prepare a kind of organizational map. For instance, they would soon know who were the 10 people who Pablo Escobar most frequently spoke to on the phone, and then who were the 10 people that each of those 10 most frequently spoke to. You can form a fairly sophisticated map of the inner workings of an organization. The nucleus of the Medellin cartel was Rodriguez Gacha, a.k.a. El Mexicano, the Ochoa brothers, Fabio, Jorge Luis, uh, Juan David, and Pablo Escobar as the leader. So it was a conglomerate. They would get together. They would borrow each other's airstrips, airplanes, uh, borrow each other's labs. And they were doing loads of coke into Mexico. Then Mexico would bring it to the United States. With Centra Spike flying and listening overhead, the Colombians place a team in Medellin with the dangerous task of acting on Centra Spike intelligence. They created their own special unit of elite uh, police and soldiers called the Blockade Busqueda, or the Search Block, uh, which existed specifically to go after men like Pablo Escobar. Commanding the search block would be the most dangerous job in the most dangerous country on Earth. It was a job that nobody wanted because whoever was going to be in charge of this group going after Escobar would become immediately a target of Escobar's. The man who commanded the search block was Colonel Hugo Martinez. Martinez accepts on the condition that he will be periodically rotated out of the hot seat. It was understood that there was to be a change in personnel every 15 days. However, there was never a change in personnel. I remained on duty the entire time. Hugo Aguilar is selected as Colonel Martinez's right hand. We were chasing after the most dangerous criminal organization in the world, backed by more than a thousand men in uniform from a combination of various Colombian armed forces. As soon as the search block was formed, Pablo Escobar announced that he was going to kill 60 members of the search block in the first month. And then he proceeded to make good on his word. He says he will destroy the search block within eight days. In those eight days, he placed two car bombs, which killed approximately 25 police officers. In the first weeks of the search block's efforts, scores of the men were killed. There were times when we would feel powerless before such a criminal. Though the Colombian government considers disbanding the search block, Colonel Martinez asks for and receives more men and continues targeting Escobar's organization. The first of the drug traffickers that Centra Spike targeted and found was Rodriguez Gacha. When the Centra Spike located Gacha on a hilltop, Finca, just outside of Bogota, they turned over this information to the Colombian government. Gacha and three of his associates are gunned down in a battle with Colombian forces. Gacha went down fighting, I mean, uh, you know, shooting at the police. Escobar would soon lose more vital assets. Centra Spike enabled the uh, search block uh, to target uh, a lot of the key people right around Pablo Escobar. They started arresting people, they started killing people. The search block began killing or arresting uh, the, the top people around Pablo, including his longtime uh, associate and his cousin, Gustavo. And Gustavo Gaviria was the brains behind the Medellin cartel. Escobar remains unaware that Centra Spike is listening in from above. Centra Spike got to be so effective that Pablo came to suspect that he had 
an informer in his inner circle. So he began torturing and killing people around him who he suspected of uh, collaborating with the authorities. What he didn't realize was that the information was being provided by the secret American unit center spike. Escobar was not the only one who operated by violence. All of these uh, hitmen and associates of Escobar were killed in what the police would euphemistically call shootouts with the uh, police. Colonel Martinez or his troops may have gone to the extreme, but this wasn't a normal criminal that they were after. Pablo Escobar rates right up there with Adolf Hitler. This is a man that's responsible for thousands and thousands of deaths of innocent people. The search block was a 700-man SWAT team. And you can't run an operation like that without it, it being violent. They were being shot at and killed all the time. This was a war. It was an armed confrontation between the Medellin cartel and the state. Desperate for an advantage in his war against the state, Pablo begins kidnapping Colombian dignitaries. I was kidnapped on uh, September 19, uh, 1990. I was um, a classical kidnapping in which a couple of cars, three cars blocked your car. They killed uh, my driver. He was doing that to exert his power and show the Colombian government, the Colombian people, that he could get to anybody. Escobar will use his hostages to negotiate the terms of a surrender. Escobar decided that what he needed was a comfortable, secure base of operations where he and his associates could live, uh, be protected from their enemies, from members of the Cali cartel, from the Colombian search bloc and the Colombian National Police, uh, from the United States. In, in case he was captured, he would use us as, as, as bargaining chips. As Escobar negotiates with the Colombian government, the hostages remain in the hands of his sicarios. I was kept um, in a very small room. I was chained to a bed, I had four guards. It's an experience in which uh, you survive by the second. When you're in the hands of Pablo Escobar, you don't know what's gonna happen. You know, you can be dead the next second. So I didn't have any illusions of surviving. I thought I was gonna die. January 24th, 1991. Pablo executes one of his hostages. Days later, another is killed in a rescue attempt. That was the toughest point. I cried a lot. Uh, I got used to, to knowing that uh, maybe the next day would be my last day. At this point, Pablo is literally running from hideout to hideout, knowing that if Colonel Martinez catches up to him, he's going to be killed, uh, but at the same time, not wanting to uh, surrender until the terms had been worked out to his satisfaction. Pablo is playing a very dangerous game with the Colombian government. He felt the pressure. He knew we were getting very close. Al presidente se le the president was warned about the danger in negotiating with Pablo Escobar. Sin embargo, but he went right ahead. Adelante. The deal that Pablo made with the government of Colombia was he would discontinue his violent campaign against the state in return for being able to build his own prison on a mountaintop just outside of Medellin called La Catedral. May 20th, 1991. As a concession towards his private sanctuary, Escobar releases his remaining hostages. I couldn't believe it. They took me to the street. They gave me money for a, a cab. And finally, a guy uh, picked me up, and I told him, uh, please take me back home. As part of Pablo's deal, General Maza is removed from his case. With construction underway on Escobar's private prison, one last demand must be met. They actually held a Continental Congress, basically, uh, where they rewrote the Constitution of Colombia to ban extradition. And the day 
that the amendment to an extradition was put into the Constitution, Pablo Escobar turned himself in. He held a press conference on the mountaintop outside the prison and graciously announced that he decided to uh, end his war against Colombia. He sent this message. Tell President Gaviria I will not let him down. The agreement was thus sealed. I personally viewed it, along with my colleagues working on the search, as having been defeated. He knew we were close to getting to him, and this was his way out. To us, it was a defeat. We had lost, and he had won. Even as Pablo is incarcerated in La Catedral, he sends a message to Colonel Martinez. They discovered a bomb that had been planted by one of Pablo's hitmen. Pablo's deal with the government of Colombia evidently didn't include uh, ending his war against Colonel Martinez. with Colombian cocaine boss Pablo Escobar serving time in his own prison at La Catedral. No one in Colombia is breathing easy. It was a different kind of prison in the sense that he wasn't actually required to stay there. Uh, he would frequently turn up at soccer matches in Medellin or Christmas shopping in Bogota. I've been in a lot of prisons in my 26 years, and uh, this is definitely not cl classified as a prison. A resort would be a more accurate way to describe La Cathedral Isle. They would bring truckloads of uh, friends and prostitutes uh, to party with them. He built a discotheque inside of the prison, which was used as the party room. My favorite part of the deal was that uh, the Colombian National Police, i.e. Colonel Martinez and his search block, were not allowed within 20 kilometers of the prison. Um, we made a huge mistake. We underestimated the capacity of Escobar for corruption and intimidation. Disastrous. Disastrous. You could not negotiate with Pablo Escobar. Pablo Escobar was a psychopath, a mentally sick individual. And he proved it. Pablo got set up in La Catedral and began to reconsolidate his hold over the cartel. In fairly short order, he built the Medellin cartel back up to where it was exporting more cocaine than it ever had in its history. He was still doing his same old activities of ordering the killings of people, of sending dope. Uh, so nothing had changed except that now he was safer. Some of his subordinates had begun basically running the organization for themselves and apparently had been helping themselves to uh, large portions of the profits. Two of the associates who were doing this, the heads of the Galeano and the Mancata families, were invited up to the prison for a chat with Pablo. Pablo had them both executed. I'm declaring a Fujimori. In other words, I'm taking over. I am uh, taking over the government, and uh, I am the boss now. I run everything. President Gaviria had put up with a lot of the criticism of his deal, but the embarrassment of putting Pablo up in such luxury and giving him such relative freedom finally uh, reached a turning point when he learned of the executions inside the prison. And so he was, he was like running his business from Yale, and uh, he gave orders to, to move him to Bogota. Ambassador Morris Busby receives the news while back in the States. The phone rang, and it was Janet Christ, who was the political counselor, and she said, the president has moved against uh, Escobar. Uh, he has sent a military team up to Embigado, and they're going to take him out of the prison. He made the decision that they had to move Pablo from his self-built prison to a real one. Eduardo Mendoza, who was a vice minister of justice for Colombia, was sent up with the army unit just to observe. but. Of course, Escobar found out about this before they got there. With Escobar aware of their plans, the army refuses to enter the prison. Mendoza took it upon himself to go in the prison to negotiate with Escobar to try to reassure him that he really was just going to be transported to a different prison. And, well, things went badly. 
Escobar got very angry with him and said this was a violation of his agreement with the president and basically took Mendoza captive inside the prison. Justice Minister Mendoza is held at gunpoint inside Escobar's living quarters. While Mendoza was being held captive in the prison, Pablo's men kept threatening to kill him. As the standoff continues through the night, President Gaviria calls in the Colombian Special Forces. Time was passing, and we need to do it. In the early morning hours, they assaulted the prison. Mendoza, in the confusion, was corralled by one of the Special Forces sergeants that threw him to the ground and basically sat on him and then directed him on how to run out of the line of fire and managed to escape with his life. It was incredible what happened. I was indignant and furious because I did not understand, and I do not today. Several hours later, Janet called again and said there, there has been a real fiasco. Um, the whole operation was a failure. They discovered that Escobar had escaped. Escape is not the correct word. He walked out of the prison. Now he controlled the guards. He controlled everything. I think he had like 12 of his best assassins staying with him, and they all escaped that night. The Americans associated with this mission were delighted that Pablo had escaped because while he was in prison, they hadn't been able to go after him at all. Now that he was free, it opened up the possibility of targeting him again and killing him. We were elated because the hunt was on again, and we knew we were going to get him. President Gaviria makes a plea to the U.S. Embassy. Gaviria had said to me, um, you know, I don't know what restrictions you've been operating under, under the, in this country up to the present time, but I'm telling you right now, we need your help. There are no restrictions. I asked full, full cooperation of the U.S. in this matter. We needed to find Escobar. He asked Ambassador Busby for a military help, and the first thing that occurred to Busby was Delta Force. He made a request to Washington to bring Delta Force to Colombia to help lead and train the Colombian forces to go after him. We got some assets into the country. We got a lot of very, very competent people that came to Colombia literally within hours. All kinds of groups were there. The unit, the agency, Central Spike, all to provide support for the Colombian command. I always believed that we had a very, very good shot at finding Escobar in the early going. He was the crown jewel. He is what we wanted. Delta Force places two operators at La Catedral. While Centra Spike would put their ears on the target, Delta Force would put their eyes on it. Centra Spike and Delta Force were able to pinpoint Escobar's location literally days after he'd escaped from prison. By the time the Colombian forces act on the American intelligence, Pablo has vanished. In order to be successful with Pablo, it had to be very time sensitive because if we got intelligence that Pablo Escobar was at Location X last night, chances are he wasn't there anymore. As Escobar's trail grows cold, a decision is made to reform the original search block. This time, it will have the full support of the United States law enforcement, intelligence, and counterterrorism agencies. Peña and Murphy went to live in, in Medellin with the task force. I mean, they, that's, that was their second home. This search block was now more organized, uh, had more of a focus, had more intelligence, had better equipment to start the second search for Escobar. With corruption and fear permeating the Colombian forces, there is one clear choice for commander of the new search block. I did not ask to be reassigned to head the operations. But when he escaped from La Catedral, my immediate thought was, this represents an opportunity to finish the job. 
terminar nuestro trabajo. He was one of the few Colombian police officers that was not afraid of Pablo Escobar, and he was completely obsessed with getting Pablo. So a decision was made to, uh, to bring Colonel Martinez back. They spent the latter part of uh, 1992 basically training Martinez and his men to be more effective, basically to be a proxy Delta Force in this effort to get Escobar. The search block immediately begins launching daring raids throughout Medellin. It was very stressful. I mean, it's one of the most stressful, I guess, dangerous points in my life. You gotta remember that we were going after probably one of the world's most dangerous persons. Through his lawyers and the press, Escobar desperately tries to reclaim his deal with the government. But this time, there will be no deal. We all the time say, he can only give up. We will not guarantee him anything. And it was very clear to everyone involved that the intention was no longer to arrest Pablo, to bring him to justice or put him in prison. At this point, they were just looking for him to kill him. 